All right, good morning once again, and welcome to our services. If you have your Bibles, you can be opening to the book of 1 Timothy, chapter number 3. And last week, we actually finished up our study of 1 Timothy. We've looked at all the scriptures from chapter 1 all the way through chapter 6. And we've been studying who should we be in 2023. And we are to part number 11, I believe. <clears throat> so it's taken us a while to get through. But today I kind of want to just do a summary review and kind of recap some things. And I'd like for us to look at the theme verses for the book. And it's in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Paul wrote this letter in order to instruct Timothy. And as we read 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, he says, These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Now, Paul wrote this letter in order to instruct Timothy on behavior. Notice it says, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the church of God. Now, this word behavior really references his conversation, or that's another way to say lifestyle. And so to the Christian, our testimony is vitally important. And our testimony finds its standing in our behavior or our lifestyle or the choices that we make or the way we live our life. So when we ask the question, who should we be in 2023? We are also asking the question, what should I do in 2023? Why is this so important? Does it really matter in the long run? Well, let's look at some reasons that Paul had to Timothy or to write this book to Timothy. Of course, it's by divine inspiration. It's, it's good for us all to know. But let's look at a couple of things. Chapter 1, verse number 20. Paul was writing about some things, and he says, uh, concerning those that have shipwrecked their faith, he said, of whom is Hamanius and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. And I want to focus on the last part of that. Paul is writing to Timothy, talking about holding fast to the faith, holding true to the faith. And so he also says, he throws in here these two people whom he was dealing with, who he delivered unto Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. Right. There was a lesson in there. The lesson is that these people would not blaspheme the name of God and the doctrine of God. So it was important that we all learn not to blaspheme. And again, we're talking about saved people here. right? Because Paul was writing to Timothy, a young preacher, He's writing about how Timothy is supposed to behave. We're not talking about the lost world. We're not talking about those outside. Because here's the great thing. You know, when you're out fishing, you don't eat the fish until after you catch the fish. And after you catch the fish, that's when you clean it, right? You don't clean it up before you catch it. Well, that's the same way with people. We can't expect them to be Christians outside, they're going to be sinners. They're going to be lost. They're going to do what the lost world does. It's only when they come to know Christ that their life is changed and Jesus Christ can clean them up, okay? So let's think about that. But here, one of the reasons for Timothy having a testimony and Timothy living the life that he did was so that others would learn not to blaspheme the name and the doctrine of God. Because if we drop down to chapter 2 and verse number 4, it says, "...who will have all men to be saved..." and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God wants all people to be saved. That's a pretty simple statement. But if you think about it, it's also linked to our testimony. Because what if our testimony drives somebody away from Christ? What if the way we live our life causes somebody else not to come to Christ? Well, if that's what a Christian is, I don't want to be that. They're no different than anybody else. Why do I need Christ? They're living like the world. Again, how many times do you guys say it? What's the number one accusation against Christians? Hypocrites. We're hypocrites. And I always say, you're right, 
Come on, we need one more, right? Because everybody's a hypocrite. But people know how Christians are supposed to live their life. And when we don't match these things, when we don't live by the scriptures that we claim to preach, it's a problem. And so what we have here is God wants all people to be saved. And so if we also want what God wants, we want all people to be saved. And if we want all people to be saved, then we ought to live like Christ. That's going to be important. Drop down here in chapter 2, verse number 10. He's talking about women and their apparel and not to get lost in the details again because we already covered that before. But verse 10 says, But which becometh women professing godliness with good works. He's talking about them having a testimony of good works, women having a testimony of good works. But notice he says there in the parenthetical statement, which becometh women professing godliness. If you profess godliness, there is a way to live. God has standards. God has principles that we are supposed to live by. Now, again, I want to stress that we don't serve God, we don't live this way in order to obtain our salvation, because we can't do that. There is no good work that we can do to earn our salvation. There's no amount of good works we can do to earn our salvation. But... After we're saved and we understand the love that God has for us and the great price that he paid for us, we become the, where we appreciate him and we love him. And therefore, because we love him, we want to serve him and do the things that he would have us to do. Mm -hmm. I always find it kind of concerning when Christians, you know, they, they look, and I use the term loosely, okay? When Christians read the Bible and say, well, you know, I don't think God really meant that. Uh, if he didn't really mean it, why did he write it down? You know, well, I don't think that's what God meant by that. Well, it's pretty plain. It's in black and white. You can read it for yourself. It's not hard to put things in context and come to the idea of what it really means. But so many people want to avoid God's standards when it's uncomfortable. They want to avoid God's standards when it offends their beliefs, their personal beliefs, right? But it's important that Christians who are professing godliness live godly. That seems to make sense, right? Seems to be pretty plain. Why do we have such a problem with it? <laughs> We're humans. Well, there's some more reasons why Paul wrote this to Timothy. Go over to chapter 3 and verse number 7. <clears throat> Talking about the qualifications of pastors and deacons. Verse 7, he says, Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. What was one of the reasons Paul wrote this to Timothy and wanted Timothy to teach this to others? so that they would not fall into the reproach and snare of the devil. He's talking about qualifications of, again, the pastor and the deacon. And he says, look, your pastor needs to have a good reputation. Not amongst the church people. Notice what he said. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without. What does the community think? Is he a lying cheat? You know, I've, I've met some people that have been very opposed to church and very opposed to different people because some preacher hurt them or some preacher did this or some pastor had a failure. And they look at that and they lump everybody into the same group and they say, you're all just the same. And it hurts. And so again, we have to have the idea of a good testimony so that we can live before the world and pr promote Christ to those that are around us. Go over to verse 16 of chapter number 4. Again, we're kind of just bouncing through 1 Timothy here because we're looking at all these reasons why Paul wrote this to Timothy, and it was all concerning his behavior, his lifestyle. Chapter 4, verse 16, Paul tells him, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Again, we're not talking about eternal salvation here. He's talking about deliverance. Deliverance from the things of the world. Deliverance from the snares of the devil. All these things. And how does Timothy avoid all that? How does Timothy deliver himself? Go back to the first part of the verse. It says, take heed unto yourself. That's kind of a way of saying, be careful. Watch what you're doing, Timothy. It's important you watch what you're doing, Timothy. And unto... The doctrine. 
What's doctrine? I, I love when, you, when people tell me, oh, I don't like doctrinal preaching. <laughs> really? Because the word doctrine simply means teaching. You don't like anything that teaches you? No, they just want the fluffy stuff, right? He's talking about... Timothy, take hold of the doctrine, the doctrines that you've been taught, the doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ, the teachings that you have in Christ, okay? Hold on to those things. Take heed, be careful with them. Latch on to them. He says, continue in them. Because if you continue in the doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to deliver yourself, but not just yourself, Timothy, and them that hear thee. He was to be an example to his congregation. He was to be an example to those around the world that he would be preaching to. So again, we have the idea, this deliverance, saving people heartache. If you could stop somebody from a tragic situation, wouldn't you try? Folks, there's a lot of people that are in a tragic situation right now. They're on their way to hell. Do we care? Are we going to witness to them? Are we going to live our lives before them in a way that we can present Christ effectively to them? Are we going to hold on to the doctrine of Christ so we can share the truth with them? That's what he's talking about. It's important that we have our behavior as becometh godliness. Chapter 5, verse number 14. Paul giving instructions again to these ladies, these widows. Verse 14, he says, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. He's talking about the behavior of these young widows. He says the young widows, they need to get remarried. They get, need to get remarried. They need to bear children. They need to guide the house. Why? The important part, he says, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Live as a good Christian woman so that the devil, the adversary, has no reason to bring a reproach against us. Don't give an opportunity for reproach. And what do we do as Christians all the time? You know, we pull this chair out for the devil, let him sit down and have a field day in our lives sometimes. <clears throat> And what does the world think? Well, there goes those Christians again, those hypocrites. They're doing their thing again. They're telling me I have to live a certain way, and they won't even hold to their own standards. So he says, we don't want to give opportunity to the adversary. We don't want the adversary to have anything to accuse us of. Now, let's be honest. Can we live perfectly? No, we're going to make mistakes from time to time, but there's a great thing that we have. We have Jesus Christ as our advocate, right? What's an advocate? Kind of a legal term, isn't it? Someone that stands there for you. They, they argue your case for you. And the great thing is, when we repent of our sins, we confess our sins, he forgives us our sins, what does our advocate do? He says, put it on me. Satan is the adversary, and Scripture talks about him bringing accusations against God's people. And he's accusing us and accusing us and he's accusing us. And if we think about it as a courtroom... You've got Jesus as our defense attorney, and you've got Satan as the prosecuting attorney. And Satan brings up, he says, well, look at what he did. He did this, and he did that. And Jesus says, I've already covered it. It's already been paid for. So the devil is going to bring accusation against us one way or another. Now, thankfully, we can have forgiveness in Christ Jesus. But wouldn't it be better so we don't have to, and this is going to sound weird, but so we don't have to have Jesus continually advocating for us. <laughs> Let's not extra sin, right? Now, he's going to be our advocate. He's always our advocate. He's always our paracletos. He's always the one who walks alongside us, okay? But wouldn't it be nice to give him a break, just humanly speaking? Don't give opportunity for reproach. Drop down to chapter 5, verse number 20. <clears throat> Them that sin, rebuke before all that others also may fear. This is a shocking statement. Because as we studied this, remember, chapter 5, verse 1 says, rebuke not an elder. But here in chapter 5 and verse 20, he's actually saying, them that sin, rebuke. Now, he says, don't take an accusation unless you have some witnesses and all the different things that are wrapped up in that. 
But notice he's talking about elders. If an elder sin, if a pastor, if a leader in the church sin, what is the congregation supposed to do? It says, rebuke him. Take him in the back room, slap his wrist, and then let him go out his business. Is that right? No, what did it say? Rebuke him before all. Why rebuke a sinning pastor before all? Look, if the pastor is held to a standard, everybody else is also held to a standard. If the pastor's not going to get away with it, nobody's going to get away with it. Sometimes we think, well, those in authority are supposed to have special position, right? We, we look at our world and, and outside the church, right? If you've got enough money and enough influence, you can get away with anything. Sometimes people think that's how it operates in the church. Well, if you're a high enough person in the church, you should be able to get away with anything. Sometimes there's some pastors that think that. But look what the scripture says. If he sins, rebuke him before all that others can come to respect God as well. They will learn to fear and respect God. Again, it comes down to testimony. We want to have a testimony before people that we think of sin exactly what God thinks of sin. And we're not going to put up with it. I find it interesting that people will submit to all sorts of agreements and all sorts of uh, requirements for all sorts of other groups. You know, right? If, if you're going to be part of the Rotarians, they have a certain list of things that you're supposed to do as a Rotarian or a Lions Club member, or, you know, Masons for, you know. They all have their initiation rights, they all have their rules, they all have their laws, but then when it comes to the Lord's New Testament church, we just say, oh, anything goes, everything's fine, there's no standards, there's no right, there's no wrong. Well, there is, there's a rule book. Again, we don't follow the rules in order to be saved, but afterwards we live according to the rules out of love because we are saved. But notice again, if we go to chapter 6 and verse 1, it says, Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. When we started over in chapter 1, what was the reason Paul wrote this again? Chapter 1, verse 20, that they would learn not to blaspheme. Now over here in chapter 6 and verse 1, what are we talking about? That people not blaspheme God and the doctrine of God. The whole thing is talking about testimony, how you live. Again, to be clear, we do not serve in order to be saved. We serve because we are saved and we love Christ. So here's a question for you. You say you love Christ. You're a professing Christian today. How much is too much to sacrifice for the Lord? Well, Lord, I'll, I'll do that, but you know this one thing here, I don't want to give it up. Oh, I love all of God's Word, except for that one part where it says this. We like to try to treat the Bible like it's a la carte. I'll take a little bit over here, and a little bit over there, and a little bit over there. Look, the Bible's not a buffet. It all goes together. From Genesis to the maps, it all goes together, okay? The idea is, it's God's Word, and if it's God's Word and we have a problem with it, who do we have a problem with? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's God. So let's get back to God's word because it matters. There is nothing more important than serving the Lord to be a witness and a testimony to those who are lost. Matter of fact, Jesus said his mission was to seek and to save that which was lost. If we're to be like Christ, what should our mission be? To seek and to save that which was lost. Now, we can't save anybody. I'm not going to die for anybody. I can't die for anybody. I can't give my life in exchange for somebody else's salvation. That's not possible. But what I can do is point people to Christ. So as we think about this, we ask the question, what should we do in 2023? Well, let's go over to the book of Colossians, if you will. Colossians chapter 3. I want to read just a few verses over there. Colossians chapter 3, verse number 1. He says, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Stop for just a moment. If ye be risen with Christ, what is he saying? 
if you've buried the old man and now walk in newness of life, if you are the new creature in Christ, if you're saved, if you are a professing Christian, if you are a child of God, okay? You don't have to raise your hands, but are you a child of God today? If you are a child of God today, then does this apply to you? If ye be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. What's he saying? Seek that which is above. Didn't Jesus himself say to us on the Sermon on the Mount, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Seeking first the things of God. What is our primary thought? What is our primary focus? Is it on the things of God or the things of this earth? If we're risen with Christ, if we're a new creature, it should be on the things of God, not on the things of the earth. Because our life is hid with Christ in God. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain, Paul said. Living is Christ. Verse 4, when Christ who is our life shall appear, then ye shall also appear with him in glory. You know we're going to have the glory of Christ? Because we will appear with him in glory, if you look at the next verse, verse 5 says, mortify therefore. And I said it in Sunday school, and I'll say it again. Whenever you see the word therefore in the Bible, you've got to know what it's there for. And so, what is it there for? It references what has just been said. Because we will appear with Christ in his glory, mortify, that is, put to death, your members which are upon the earth. Crucify the flesh is what he's saying. So that Christ and his life may abound in us. Mortify our members, our limbs, right? Right? We're supposed to yield our bodies as a sacrifice unto Christ. Paul wrote that in Romans, right? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's not unreasonable for God to ask us this. Now let's go on. He says, verse 5 again, uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse uh, 5. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetous, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. See, we're, we're all God's creation, but we're not all God's children. There are children of disobedience, those that are not saved, those that are outside of, of the family of God, those that are children of the devil. And what do children of the devil do? Well, he just had a list. And that's why God's going to judge him for those things, okay? But notice verse 7. He says, In the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. Guess what? All you children of God, you used to be a child of the devil. And when you were a child of the devil, you did the things like your father did. You did all those things. But praise be to God in Christ Jesus, now you are made alive in Christ. And now you are part of the family of God. Now you are children of God. Therefore, verse 8, but now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man and his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. You've put off the old man, now put on the new one. Put on the new man. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. But notice he says here, we're supposed to be renewed. This is renovated. You ever do a renovation? This is what's happening with us. We're being renovated. Renovated how? In knowledge. This idea carries with it the full discernment. The full discernment of what? He says, being renewed in the knowledge after the image, or that word after can mean according to, according to the image of him that created him. 
We are supposed to be renovated by full discernment of the image of Christ. I want to look at one other scripture. If you have your Bible, go over to Romans chapter number 8 and verse number 29. It's a verse that a lot of people get wrong because they don't understand the concept of God's foreknowledge and predestination and all this kind of stuff. But I want to pay close attention to the words. Verse 29, he says, For whom he did foreknow. Does God know who will and won't be saved? Yes. Does God force anybody to be saved? No. But he does know who's going to make that choice. And now let's understand. For whom he did foreknow, who God knew who would be saved, he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn, firstborn among many brethren. This verse does not say that they were predestined for salvation. This verse tells us that all who will be saved, that God knew would be saved, God predestined those people, not for salvation, but to be conformed to the image of his Son. What is God trying to do in the life of every Christian? Conform us to the image of his Son. Someday, when we get to glory, and our old sin body is put away, and we're made completely new, that process will be completed. But guess what? Right now here on this earth, it's a process. Sometimes it's a painful process. But God is trying to conform us to be more like Christ. Why did Paul write the book of 1 Timothy to Timothy? So he would learn how to behave. <laughs> Guess what, children of God? We need to learn how to behave. <laughs> Who should we be in 2023? The answer is more like Christ. We're supposed to be the image of Jesus Christ. Can you honestly say today that you act like Jesus Christ? If the answer is no, you got some work to do. You got some soul searching to do. You got some heart searching to do. Are you doing the things that are right in his sight? And let's be clear, not right in our own sight because we can justify a lot of things, but right according to his word. Are we following the scriptures? Do you even know what's right? That's an interesting challenge. A lot of people don't. They say they do, but they don't. Because in order to find out what is right, you know what you got to do? You got to read the Bible. You got to get in the Word. And not just when the preacher stands up here and says, turn your Bibles to this book. Every day in the Word of God, learning, becoming to know more like Him. You know, the, Christian, the question really comes down to, do you even know the Lord as your Savior today? All of this, what we've talked about today, applies to those who already know Jesus Christ as their Savior. The children of God are supposed to be a witness and a testimony to those who are outside of Christ. But today, maybe you're outside of Christ. I pray that you would purpose to know Him today. Pray that you would understand how much he loved you. He loved you so much he died on the cross for you. He took your place. He took your punishment so that you could have your slate wiped clean in Jesus Christ. Salvation's easy. We A, admit that we're a sinner. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All means all. There's not a human save for Jesus that was sinless, right? Jesus is the only one that was sinless. A, B, C, we A, admit that we're a sinner. B, we believe that Jesus died for our sins and rose again to offer us eternal life. That's salvation, folks, right there, right? Thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. Where the heart man believeth unto righteousness and where the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It's that simple. Ethiopian eunuch said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He was saved. No magic words. No repeat after me, belief in the heart that Jesus is who he is and did what he did. And we confess, Romans 10, 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Simple, simple.
Have you experienced the love of Christ? Are you saved today? Do you know if you were to die right now where you'd go? If you're not sure, I'm glad to talk to you. But Jesus wants you to go to heaven. Jesus wants you to be with him for all eternity. There's going to be a new heaven, new earth. But we get to be with God for all eternity. Let us purpose to know Christ. And then let us purpose to emulate him. If you're a child of God, act like it. Who should you be in 2023? The image of Christ. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, thank you again for the day you've given to us. Thank you for the time we have together. Lord, I just pray you'd bless your word and help us to take it to heart. Thank you for preserving it for us, Lord. Thank you again for the inspired word that you had Paul write to Timothy that we can use as a recipe for our own lives. Lord, help us to make those applications. And Lord, I pray that we'd all search our own hearts and see where we stand with you, that again, you would be honored and glorified through all things. We know that you want all people to be saved. And Lord, we thank you, those of us that know Jesus Christ as our Savior, we praise you that you've given us that opportunity. Lord, we also know that there's others that have not. So we just pray you give them time and opportunity to repent and help us to speak the word and to live the life that we should before them, that they could see Christ in us and come to know you. Lord, I just pray you'd be with the remainder of our service today, be with our time of invitational, and I just pray that your will is done. Thank you again for loving us and blessing us. We ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Amen.